Peter Barlas here, cardiologist. Now, I've had several requests to do a video on the heart rate being slow or bradycardia. Let's find out how low is too low. Now the heart itself is an amazing organ as we've witnessed uh, through many of our videos about how the heart functions and pumps. The heart beat normally ranges between 60 to 100 beats per minute. Anything less than 60 beats per minute we usually call bradycardia. And vice versa, anything more than 100 beats per minute with our pulse, that is referred to as tachycardia. Now bradycardia is not always a worrying problem. So many people, young, fit, otherwise active people, can have heart rates that are less than 60 beats per minute, between 40 and 60 beats per minute. When we're sleeping, our heart rate is usually low, 40, 50 beats per minute. It does not mean there's something wrong. When bradycardia becomes a concern is when there are symptoms that can occur as a result of the heart not being able to efficiently pump blood and oxygen and nutrients to the rest of the body. The frequent symptoms that you may have if your heart is going too slow is you might feel lightheaded, you might feel giddy, dizzy, you might feel as though you're a bit wobbly on your feet or about to, to pass out, a condition known as presyncope. Or in some people, they have fainting, they have blackouts, they have syncope. So we always take it into the context of the patient and their condition, their symptoms, what medication they might be on, what other history they might have. So on its own, having a slow heart rate is not a serious problem and people live active, normal lives without any concerns. But when the heart rate does go too slow and is causing symptoms, then we need to take some action and perform some further tests. Now to get a better idea about the heart rate and how it works, I want to just briefly go through how our wiring or electrical system of our heart functions. And I like to describe an analogy that we have a power station of our heart called the sinus node. And the sinus node essentially is our own natural pacemaker. It's a little collection of fibers and tissue that stimulates activity from the top parts of the heart called the atria. And that activity goes down through a channel of cables, I like to say, to a substation. So we've got the power station being the sinus node, we've got the substation being a collection of tissue called the AV node. And then through there, there's a rather complex array of fibres and cables that pass through both the left and the right sides of the heart called the bundles. And the bundles, we, we often, you might have heard of a term called bundle branch block. Well, these are the cables that get affected when there is this bundle branch block. So the heart has a very intricate wiring network. As I said, the sinus node being the pacemaker, the top part of the heart beats the atria. Conduction travels down to the heart to get the ventricles to contract. So we get the boom, 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 boom manifestation of what our heart does. And when that's working fine, well, we're not noticing any particular symptoms. However, when there are delays in the conduction or delays in how the electrical supply is actually traveling through these fibers, through these cables, then that is when problems may arise. And commonly, and I want to break it down into problems that affect the pacemaker itself of our heart, the actual power station, the sinus node, and then we've got problems that can develop further downstream. In some people, the sinus node or the power station just slows down as we get 
older, there might be a history of heart disease, there might have been you know, heart attacks, there might be some people who have blockages in their arteries, and those arteries do supply critical blood flow to these little areas of our heart called the sinus node. Well, when that is impacted, then the sinus node doesn't fire properly, and that can slow the heart down to levels whereby it starts causing symptoms down you know to, to the 30s even and 20s and that becomes a concern because obviously you are at risk of fainting or blacking out with a lack of blood flow traveling to the body traveling to the brain so we always explore what are the possible causes and we talked about you know coronary artery disease being one of the more common conditions that leads to these conduction problems, but there might be other conditions. There might be endocrine conditions or hormone conditions. You might have heard of a gland called the thyroid gland, which is in our, in our neck. And that's a central gland that controls many of our bodily functions. And when that is misfiring and not functioning properly, too low, underactive, and sometimes even too high, it can create concerns in the conduction system of our heart, leading to problems with the heart rate, and slowing it down. There might be other conditions that you might have been born with, congenital heart defects or holes in the heart or various conditions there that can actually impact the way that the electrical system is firing and working that can dramatically lower or slow down the heart rate. This can be seen in other conditions that affect the heart muscle itself in anything that causes inflammation myocarditis is a condition that can be a post virus, post you know vaccine where myocarditis affects the muscle, it can also affect those little networks of tissue that are essential at controlling how our heart is beating. And that can also cause a very slow pulse. Imbalances in chemicals in our bloodstream, potassium in particular, and these are the electrolytes that are very, very important in how our heart contracts and functions. Well, changes in those can also affect our heart and heart rate and slow it down. And then there are medications, and there are several medications that people might be on that equally can have an impact at actually slowing down the conduction or the, the heart rate. You might have heard of a class of drug called beta blockers. There are calcium channel blockers. There are medications that we use to help that control the heart rhythm. Amiodarone, flecainide. There are other ones that also slow down the heart rate that uh, you might have heard of called digoxin. But all these medicines we actually use for the control of fast heartbeats, well, of course, as a result, they work on the conduction system and they slow it down, causing slow heartbeats. So we always ask our patients what medications they might be on, what other conditions they might have, and then we explore the symptoms. And most often, if the heartbeat is slow, there might not be any symptoms or any concerns at all. But what are the symptoms? Well, the key symptoms are lightheadedness or dizziness. Sometimes it can be as simple as just feeling fatigued and no energy. And particularly when you're trying to exercise or walk and do activities, you might find that the heart rate doesn't appropriately increase. And that's a key symptom that we ask for. Because having a slow heartbeat on its own when you're sleeping or when you're at rest is okay. But when you get up and do an activity when you push yourself, when you go up a flight of stairs, when you go for a walk, go for a jog, we would expect that the heart rate appropriately picks up. And that's what we want for the conduction system of our heart, to actually respond to what's going on, to respond to the rest of the body. When you're exercising, the muscle wants more oxygen and blood delivered, well, the heart rate has to increase. Well, when the heart rate doesn't, that can be a concern. And there is a condition that your doctor might have called chronotropic incompetence. And what that means is that the heart rate just doesn't improve or doesn't respond to physical exertion, physical activity as we would normally see. And there are some further tests that can be useful in that regard. And, and then of course, fainting and blackouts. The first symptom of a slow pulse might be fainting. And we do see patients who come into hospital following a collapse. They might have struck their head. There might have been seizure activity and people might get confused. Well, could this be epilepsy? And in the end, we find that it is in fact the heart rate that has just slowed down too much. So then we've talked about the problems that occur in the top part of the heart or the sinus node. But then equally, there are a key group of conditions that we look for to tell us whether the wiring is actually starting to fail. And these are degrees of heart block. 
and you might have heard of heart block. And we normally grade these into three classifications. First degree heart block, second degree heart block, and third degree heart block. Now, what does that all mean? Now, first degree heart block is one of the mildest forms, and it's often benign, doesn't really signify any particular concern or worry. The signals are still travelling from the top part of the heart, the sinus node, and still firing down to the bottom part or the, the substation, the, the AV node, but the signals are just taking a little longer. This can be seen, seen in healthy individuals. And when it's not causing any symptoms, there's no action that needs to be taken. The next type of heart block is second degree heart block. Now, as we start getting more into the second and third degree, well then the problems start becoming a little bit more concerning because in second degree heart block, we're still getting signals coming from the top part of the heart to the bottom, but not all those signals are being transmitted appropriately and as quickly to the bottom part. So there might be some missed beats, some skip beats. And again, there are different grades of second degree heart block. Not all of them are pathological. Not all of them need anything to be, to be done apart from just some reassurance and monitoring. But there are various types whereby when the signals are not traveling to where they should, then the heart momentarily freezes and slows down. There's no beat for a few seconds and then no blood getting to the brain, therefore leading to symptoms. And then third degree heart block is obviously the, uh, the one that we, we are always looking out for, the one that we're more concerned about, because in third degree heart block, well, really, there's no coordination in terms of the signals. The signals coming from the top part of the heart are not communicating appropriately to the signals at the bottom part of the heart, and that lack of coordination, the fact that not all the signals are traveling means that the heart is skipping beats, is missing beats, is slowing down, and that does need to be corrected and treated. Now, what are the treatment options? Well, as I said, in many cases, having a slow heartbeat does not mean a thing, does not mean any concern whatsoever. There are some simple tests that can be done, including an electrocardiogram and ECG. We, we also consider popping a monitor on the heart just to see what the pattern of your heart rate is over a 24-hour period, or sometimes even a bit longer, a couple of days, seven days, even 30-day monitors. And in some individuals who might have blackouts and fainting, well, there can be a, a case to consider placing a little implantable recorder. And we'll have a separate video on what those implantable recorders are and, and how they might be useful. So in cases whereby the heart rate is slow and is causing these second and third degree heart blocks where there is a disconnect between the signals, well, then in those cases, we need to address underlying causes. We often you know, perform some simple tests, including an ultrasound of the heart, and that gives us an idea about how the heart is pumping and functioning, how the valves are performing. But then we start looking at, well, what are the underlying causes? Now, are there any hormonal changes, any thyroid problems? Are there any concerns with the electrolytes, the potassium levels in our body? And are you on any medication that might be contributing that we may need to stop? But if the answer is no to all of those, then we're just left with essentially the wiring just slowing down um, you know, through natural causes, well then we often need to act. And the treatment for a slow heart rate that is causing symptoms is obviously speeding it up. There's no simple medication that unfortunately we can use to put patients on to do that. And the treatment is often by using these devices called pacemakers. So the pacemakers themselves are external devices that are placed under the skin and they, through a connection, through often two leads that go into the heart, they can monitor and they can help the pumping and the contraction of the heart by ensuring that they stimulate electrical activity to make sure that, you know, we're not slowing down too much. So, you know, that video was just a bit of an overview of the heart rate. As I said, it's not always a problem. The concern can sometimes be that when you are a bit slow, but you're not improving with exercise, and that can cause symptoms, can cause fatigue, can cause shortness of breath. And as we talked about chronotropic incompetence, when the heart rate is not picking up as it should. But then we look for various types of these heart blocks, this sort of disconnect between the top part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart, in the end may sometimes need to be managed with these pacemaker devices. Hopefully you found that useful. Until the next video, bye for now.